There was this one time I was doing the same thing and then my son stopped playing. He was on the floor and then he just looked at me and he asked me a question about the topic that I was talking about with my wife in English. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, you got that? You understood? <laughs> All right, so I'm here today with the one and only Cassie. Hey, Cassie, how's it going? Hey, Tiago. Hey, everyone. Before we get started, make sure you hit the subscribe button and bell down below because every week we put out uh, podcast episodes like that to help you go from feeling like a lost, insecure English learner to becoming a confident, natural English speaker. So hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single new episode. So we're going to be sharing here some common strategies, right, Cassie, that parents mm -hmm. use to teach English to their kids or any other second language. And um, I guess we can start by the main point we want to make in this episode. And the main point here is it's important that the child has exposure to the language you're trying to teach as young as possible and as frequently as possible. Mm -hmm. That's the point we are making here. Early exposure as frequently as possible. Yeah. And I would like to illustrate that, Kelsey, by sharing one story mm. about my son. Because um, my son now is 12 years old. Mm -hmm. But a few years ago when he was younger, um, you know, my, my wife is an English teacher as well. So we both speak English. And sometimes there were times when my son would be in the living room with us. And sometimes I wanted to talk to my wife something more adult-like. <laughs> yeah. So our strategy, instead of sending him to his bedroom, was to speak English with each other. So <laughs> I would talk to these to my wife in English about these more serious grown-up topics that I didn't want my son to, to hear about. And that strategy worked for a while, you know. <laughs> But after, I guess, I don't know, maybe a one year, you know, it wasn't that long. After a little while... There was this one time I was doing the same thing, and then my son stopped playing. He was on the floor, and then he just looked at me, and he asked me a question <laughs> about the topic that I was talking about with my wife in English. <laughs> and then I was like, wait, you got that? You understood? <laughs> <laughs> Your code was so, completely useless now. Oh, my gosh. It that's was, awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, so at that moment, the strategy, you know, wasn't effective anymore, mm -hmm. but And then I started thinking about it, like, how, how come he, he came to a point where he, he started to understand what my wife and I was speaking in English, you know? And then it came uh, the, the realization that it was the exposure. Yeah. I mean, uh, we were always very casual about this at home, but there was always exposure to English at home, watching movies together or listening to things in English. My son would watch me or sometimes hear me teaching from home classes in English or these moments where I would talk to my wife in English, you know, so simply by having that exposure that was constant and casual, eventually he got to a point where he picked up, he started to pick up things and understand things. And I thought it was amazing. So um, this, I think, illustrates well this idea of exposing the child to the language frequently And not only that, but there are strategies that parents use nowadays to uh, accomplish that. And uh, we're going to be talking about some of these strategies today. And uh, one strategy is actually the strategy that was used in your case, right, Cassie? So uh, could you share this first strategy and a little bit about your experience? Because sure. I think you grew up bilingual, didn't you? I did. And I think one thing that... I guess, worked in my favor was the fact that I grew up in a multilingual country. So I was exposed to many languages. And uh, the problem with that, though, is that, I mean, you mentioned the sort of passive absorbing of a language, which all kids do. I mean, they're listening to conversations, they're, hear they're noticing your tone or the way that you say certain things without them having a complete comprehension of what it means. They piece it like a puzzle. They're making sense of it in their own um, mind. So I think in my case, I grew up hearing many languages, but inside of the home, my parents used a strategy, which I don't think they did deliberately at the time. I don't think they knew they were doing it that way, but They ended up using a strategy which is now known as 
one parent, one language. So my dad would always speak to us in English and my mom would always speak to us in Afrikaans. So this would be like literally every instruction she would give us would be in Afrikaans. So she would say, for example, um, go pick up your shoes. But she wouldn't use English. She would only use Afrikaans to give us the instruction. So, I mean, I can see what she's pointing at. I just made sense of it. Like, I need to pick up the shoes. So she would speak to us in Afrikaans in that way. And it worked. (laughs) It completely works. However, every output... So that was a lot of input. So I wasn't necessarily having a conversation with mom in, in Afrikaans, but she did the same. She thought she was smart. She was doing what you and your wife did. So she would she would have these conversations with her friends or with my dad in Afrikaans, thinking I don't know what she's saying, but hello, <laughs> I've been listening to you for years. I know what you're saying. So just because I wasn't speaking Afrikaans, I didn't mean I wasn't understanding. So this is how I sort of ended up learning both languages you know, from the time since I was a kid, basically, I I could speak both languages. That's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. And uh, now as a grown up and as a mom, uh, would mm-hmm. you say that this is a strategy you would like to try with your son as well, or you are trying already? Yeah. Well, in my case, I, you know, every other thing, every other method of my education was in English. My, as you said, you know, TV, movies, books, music, everything else was in English. But what I want for my son is more, is a little different. So I would like to use English only in the home. Like, I I don't really want my husband and I to speak. I I don't want us to speak to him in Afrikaans, for example. I would like for him to be absorbing from his environment. So his teachers use Afrikaans, and I love that. And his other grandparents use Afrikaans as well. So I would love for him to be able to pick that up. And he's already doing it. So, uh, for example, he was splashing around in the water, and uh, he's teacher told us at the end of the day that he used the word nut. Now, nut means wet in Afrikaans. How does he know what nut is? Anyway, it's really, it's really cute. And um, I think, yeah, I, I think I would like that for him. I want him to be able to, you know, have that exposure in his environment. But more specifically, I, I think maybe um, I would like for it to be a deliberate sort of effort from the community. So these are his teachers. I I deliberately want them to use Afrikaans and my mom as well. But at home, he should feel comfortable to use English or Afrikaans. I want him to know that we can use it here, but I, I I would prefer for him to be really focused on English for a while at least. Yeah. Yeah. It's similar to my daughter because now I have a daughter, she's one and a half. And, um, you know, uh, in her first year, I didn't want to focus on English yet. Because, you know, I really wanted her first language to be Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese. Because, you know, I think it makes sense for her, you know, mother language to be Portuguese. I mean, we live in Brazil. I mean, uh, you know, uh, so um, I, I, I want English to be her second language. Now that she's already, uh, she understands pretty much everything in Portuguese now. And she's speaking already phrases in Portuguese. Now I am starting to deliberately, you know, uh, just like her mom used to do with you, uh, maybe uh, speak some English with her here and there and uh, giving some instructions like, oh, give dad a kiss. Come on, kiss. Mm, kiss. Give dad a kiss. She already calls me dad. Yeah. Since uh, forever. Because you know, in Brazil, it's not very common eh, to for kids to call their father's dad. This is more of an English word. Eh? U- usually in Brazil, it's papai, right? Papa, papai, you know. But uh, yeah, I'm, try- I'm trying to be the the parent in the house that speaks the second language with the child. Yeah, similar to how your mom spoke Afrikaans with you. Um, I have to say that I'm not so deliberate with it yet. I've been more casual about it, but um, I'm testing it out, yeah, to see. But the exposure is important here, right? And by the way, a great way for you to gain exposure to English in this case is by using the Real Life English app, because with the app, you can actually listen to this week's podcast episode with a full transcript, a full interactive transcript. So not only can you listen to us, but also read along everything that we are saying. So download the app. It's free to try. And uh, if you are watching us here on YouTube, the link is in the description. And if you are listening to us on another platform, just go to Apple App Store or Google Play Store, search for Real Life English and download the app from there. All right. Can't say, um, still mm-hmm. talking about strategies. You mentioned one that was used with you, which was one parent, one, one language. language. 
mm-hmm. right? But there are two others that I found out, and I thought they were interesting. One of them is called the MLAH, which stands for Minority Language at Home. So mm-hmm. apparently, Minority Language at Home, Majority Language Outside of the Home. Have you heard of this strategy? I have. I I actually think that it makes sense if, for example, you're living in an... I don't know, like in your case, I think it might it might be a good idea because uh, your daughter would learn English at home and then be exposed to Portuguese in, in the world. Um, and I, I'm doing it the opposite. I <laughs> reversed this. So I would basically be using English only at home and he can be exposed to the minority language outside of the home. So I, I do find the strategy quite interesting because I think it would... Uh, it would really work for kids who are living in a country where English is not the the first language or the, the, the dominant language, I would say. Yeah, I can see why that can be effective. I do, one downside of that structure for me is that I think it takes more effort on the whole family because in, mm, with this strategy, true. the whole family inside the house has to speak English in this case or yeah. the second language. Right. I mean, it's not just one parent. Yeah. Because your strategy was one parent, one language. But in this case, the mom, the dad, the siblings should be using only the second language at home. That can definitely work. But you have to analyze in your family if that is feasible. Yeah. If it is practical for you to apply. Yeah. But definitely a nice strategy to try it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think like I think one thing that I, I, I find especially on the point that you're making about it being, you know, really stressful for everyone involved is that I think we have to be consistent with these strategies. I'm not saying we have to be strict policemen, you know, if you don't do it, you know, you're going to be in trouble or something like that. I think that it just helps us to achieve results faster or to be more, um, you know, it just helps to be deliberate when we do these things. And I think with With being deliberate, you know, the results are that your kid is probably going to learn the language a lot faster. You're going to see results sooner. And I think there's something very interesting because I know the downside or one con of uh, that people often mention about raising bilingual kids or, you know, exposing them to multiple languages early on is that they end up um, either not speaking very well, they don't speak the language very well, they're confused, or they end up starting to speak quite late later on, like at four, age four or something like that. Um, I'm not laughing at those kids because I think being completely bilingual is worth it if you're only starting to speak at four. Totally fine. But um, I, I think every case is different. So I think this is something to think about for parents, right? Like what works for you, um, you know, what works for your kid as well. So yeah. That's true. And I 100% agree with you with the consistency. So pick the strategy that works best for your family and be consistent with it. Yeah, I really agree with that. So, so far we have discussed one parent, one language, minority language at home. Everybody speaks it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there's a third strategy also, which is called time and place. Mm -hmm. That means that you designate uh, specific activities Mm -hmm. that the family does. And during those activities, the second language is spoken only. So let's say, for example, whenever we have dinner together as a family, uh, we only speak English together or the second language. Mm -hmm. Or whenever we go to the park, yeah, every Sunday, our conversation is all in English. So this is another strategy, Mm -hmm. time and place. Any thoughts on this one, Cassie? It seems more flexible, yes? Yeah, I I think this in my mind, I mean, you can tell me what you think, but I I feel like this might work better for an older kid. I feel like when your child is like three, they don't really, they'll do what they want. They're little rebels at that age. Like, nah, I'm not doing it. I'll just keep. (laughs) So I think this is one that you might consider, you know, for an older kid or a toddler who is, um, you know, a little bit more interested and keen to, to try the strategy. But I think, Younger kids might benefit more from the other two strategies. Um, I mean, like I said before, they're sponges. They really, they they take in everything you're saying. So if you're having dinner, I can imagine it might be really nice for you to say, you know, this is an... A lasagna. They're like, oh, cool, lasagna, what's that? Um, maybe, I don't know, I think it's <laughs> that's Italian. <laughs> but I mean, like, um, I, 
I'm just using it, or pasta. And, um, you know, they might know it by a different name. And, and so anyway, the point that I'm making is that it's a fun, you should be, again, deliberate. So you're making that effort while you're eating. You cannot just expect um, the kids should jump in while you're having a conversation over dinner about politics. So you should make the conversation, include them in the conversation, you know, mention, you know, teach them new vocabulary phrases. Yeah, yeah, that, that's interesting what you say. I mean, maybe the time and place strategy could work with older kids. Yeah, you designate sometimes, but you know, if the child is so young, I mean, they are sponges, like you said, right? They absorb everything. So either minority language at home or, you know, one parent or one language, yeah? those seem to be uh, better strategies, right? One thing that I do nowadays with my son, because I mean, he's 12 now, yeah, he's older. So um, nowadays, uh, I kind of, I don't know if I'm being a bad parent for doing this, but you know, I kind of forbid him nowadays to watch dubbed movies. Literally, I forbid him. Yeah, he is forbidden <laughs> to watch dubbed movies. He has to watch them in English. Yeah, and uh, now he has finally, you know, at, at the beginning, uh, he would complain a lot about this because he wanted to watch it in Portuguese and everything, right? So nowadays, I allow him to watch animations dubbed. Because, you know, I think, you know, that's okay. It's an animation. Fine. Watch it dubbed. But if you are watching any other movie, that is a movie, yeah? Watch it in English. And he's already doing that. What he does today is he watches the movie with the audio in English and the subtitles in Portuguese. Fine. At least he's listening to English. I'm happy with that. But then when he watches something with my wife and I, the three of us together, sometimes we do that, then it's full on English, like audio in English and subtitles in English. And nowadays he has already adapted to this habit. And, uh, you know, uh, now, uh, you know, it's been working well and he understands a lot of things, you know, uh, so because you know, I think it's important. I started watching movies in English with my parents when I was seven, seven or eight, even though my parents didn't know English. They had this habit of watching things in English because they like to consume the movies in the original language. So maybe um, since I was younger, yeah, there was this little seed already like, oh, you know, I'm listening to English here in the movies. That's great. Even though, you know, I wasn't studying it. And it's fun. It's like, it's something that he enjoys. So yeah. he's not, you know, like you said, it's not like he's just sitting there taking notes, you know, every <laughs> phrase that he's, but I, I think this is a, a brilliant um, uh -huh. way to include the learning process, you know, into daily life. I, I think with, mm -hmm. with little kids, if your kids are younger, like my son, for example, he loves games and he loves music. And there are so many, um, like songs, kids' songs that are translated into different languages. And so, for example, he he can understand the songs. He can understand the music in other languages as well. And the apps, he always changes the apps because he loves listening to French for some reason. So you'll hear him say, bonjour, bonjour, because he, he's playing this game where every time you move the, um, anyway, the characters. Anyway, the point is that they're, they're, the language learning process can be so much fun for, for little kids, especially because um, the nursery rhymes, they learn it in another language, um, which is what he's doing at school and then again at home. And we make it part of his daily routine. So, yes, he, he's exposed to English all the time at home, but we don't stop him from, you know, if he's curious about um, you know, listening to French, for example, he has an obsession with that game. But um, anyway, yeah, it's it's something that I would definitely say works with younger kids. Yeah, I mean, because at the end of the day, children naturally pick up habits and culture from their parents. Yeah, Absolutely. so they, they observe. Yeah, yeah, so whatever the parents do, the children tend to emulate. So if you as the parent already has the habit of using English every day, Chances mm -hmm. are your child will pick up the habit from you as well. Yeah, exactly. so it will be more yeah. effortless, right? Yeah, pronunciation yeah. too. I think like let's not, you know, one thing, vocabulary, yes. But pronunciation, I think like my son uses American English. I feel better mm -hmm. than me. Um, in South Africa, we <laughs> say, you know, the classic water, it's water mm -hmm. or yeah, better. He says better. He says water. And he, I just like, I feel like that. how little one, how did you learn that? It's because he listens <laughs> right. to all of these songs and programs uh -huh. in, in, in American English. So it's that. There you go. Yeah. It's the exposure, the constant exposure. Exactly. And your listeners, um, a great way for you to, again, to live your English every day, consume English every day is by using the real life 
app because mm. you can listen to all the podcast episodes. There are interactive transcripts for you to follow along. And also you can practice your English, the vocabulary more specifically, with flashcards. And speaking of the app, I guess now is the perfect moment for us to have that shout out mm. to one of our listeners. Let's do it. So today's shout out goes to Harold, who says, Hi guys, I'm Harold from the Dominican Republic. I really want to thank you guys for the job you're doing. Before finding you guys, I tried a lot of other methods trying to speak fluent English, but I couldn't. Now that I'm applying your methods, I can speak fluently. I'm learning a lot of correct grammar, a lot of slang, a lot of phrases, and my listening skills are now so much better than before. Honestly, I would like to give you 10 stars, but the system only allows me to give you five stars. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Harold. That's awesome. Thank you. Wow. That's an amazing shout out. Thank you, Harold, for the awesome testimonial. And mm -hmm. guys, do it like Harold. If you haven't tried the app yet, make sure you download it. If you're watching us here on YouTube, again, link in the description, or you can go to Apple App Store, Google Play Store, Real Life English, and download the app right now. So, Kase, okay, still talking about bilingual kids, kids that speak more than one language. That reminds me of a, a nice movie, actually, that I saw a long time ago. I think it's from 2004, if my memory doesn't fail me now, called Spanglish with mm -hmm. Adam Sandler. Have you seen that movie? I have. It's beautiful. So, Pans Vega plays a Mexican immigrant who goes to the U.S. with her daughter for a better life. And she gets this job working for an American family in their house. And um, Adam Sandler lives there. And uh, they start having some sort of, uh, I think it starts as a working relationship that evolves to friendship or even mm -hmm. something else. Right, Cass? I don't know if they actually get to have a romantic relationship in that movie, do they? I, I, I might be mistaken, but I think that they don't. I think there's just a really deep connection there. Like, I think there's... Yeah, and I think it's beautiful because of that. It's really wholesome, I would say, I think. Ooh, that that, be... That's a nice word, wholesome. Yeah. What's that, wholesome? It's mo like sort of morally good. Like it's it's not uh, corrupt in any way. It's not, you know, there's no, nothing, no bad. There's nothing bad about their rela relationship. Well, I'm bringing this movie up because I remember that there's this funny clip where... Um, I think the mom, she gets mad at Adam Sandler's character because he gives uh, her daughter money. I, I, I think he, uh, he, he bets something with the kids, you know, and then, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> her daughter wins the bet or something like that. And then, you know, uh, the mother gets mad at that, you know, uh, because he gave her money. But then uh, this scene is funny because she doesn't speak English, the mom. She speaks only Spanish. So she needs her daughter to translate for her what she wants to say. And it's really cool to see, like, you know, the translation, the live translation. So uh, we have the clip here, T. And uh, could you please play for us the first part? And then we can talk about that a little bit. I'm Did you give this money to my daughter? Okay, I... I made a deal with the kids, all the kids. Oh, no, disculpe me. Oh, no, please. Que no acostumbra usted a preguntarle a los papás si están... You don't tell or ask the mother when you give a child a fortune. Simplemente por favor. And then, you know, uh, it becomes really hard to understand because, you know, it's like cross-talking there. Yeah. But in terms of language, we have some nice things here to point out. First of all, the question, did you give this money to my daughter? Did you give this money to my daughter? Um, how would you explain the connected speech in this question, Cassie? So basically, we have what's known as elision here. So the D sound, the D in did, and the Y in you basically form a J sound. So what you hear is basically, did you, did you, did you give this mm -hmm. money to my daughter? Yeah. And I think that's amazing because, you know, uh, the girl, her daughter, she speaks fluently, right? I mean, uh, both English and Spanish, right? She has great pronunciation. And uh, and then Adam Sandler's character replies, I made a deal with the kids. I made a deal with the kids. So what does it mean when you make a deal with someone, Cassie? If you make a deal with someone, you're agreeing to certain terms. So if this happens, I will give you this. 
So this would be considered a deal. It's an agreement. We can use that word as well, like making it, agreeing to do something. And we also have some nice connected speech here, right? Because the uh gets reduced to a schwa sound, uh, uh. And also we connect made with uh, and then it sounds like made a, made a. And then we say made a deal, made a deal with. I made a deal with the kids. That's how he says it. And then uh, this argument continues in the clip. And we have another short clip to watch. Uh, T, if you could roll it for us. And then we can dissect maybe a couple more um, meanings and uh, connected speech here. 50 dollars is mucho dinero. But 50 dollars is a lot of money. I, I know, I know. Yo sé, yo sé. Oh, shit. No hay mierda. I'm sorry. Come on. I get what you're upset about. Entiendo por qué estás enojada. Excuse me. Con permiso. <laughs> I <laughs> love... It was funny when... <laughs> What what do I think they're gonna say the same thing? What, yeah. what is it? <laughs> I, I I think it's like the mom's reaction to when she uses like the swear word. I think it's like <laughs> like how what are you saying? How how could you even say that? Yeah, it's like it's funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was funny how even that the girl translated, right? Even the swear word. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. you see her face after like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing with kids. Nice. It's like you with your, you know, um, with having your code language with your wife, I think they're, they're picking up, they know what it means. They might not, you know, maybe you don't want them to know or you don't want them to use that word, but mm, they're picking up everything. Yeah. We have some nice phrases here, Cassie. The first one, uh, the girl says a lot of money, right? But $50 is a lot of money. But there is some nice connected speech here that she, she uses. Could you break it down for us? So the A in a lot is pronounced as a schwa, a. Uh. And then we have the T in lot, which is pronounced as a flat T sound. So we pronounce it as a duh. And this then joins with the O in of, which is also pronounced as a schwa sound. So we have a la duh, a lot of, a lot mm. of money. Again, just pointing out the amazing English the girl has. Yeah? A lot of, a lot of money. She speaks just like an American, right? And then uh, Adam Sandler's character, he says this phrase, I get what you're upset about. So just to break down the pronunciation here, he says, I get, I get. So the T there is a stop T. He doesn't say I get, but I get, I get. And then what? Another stop T there. Not what, but what, what? So very often this your gets reduced to a your, which is how we hear it here. So what you're, so he says, I get what you're, I get what you're upset. And then again, the T here for upset kind of disappears. And then actually it doesn't disappear because, you know, we have a vowel right after for the about. So the T becomes a flap T, the da da sound. So upset, da da, da you see, upset about, upset about. And I believe that he says about in the clip, but it becomes optional. Some people, they say the T here at the end of the sentence. Sometimes you might not hear it. You might hear just about. But either about or about, those are common ones. But that's how he says it. I get what you're upset about. Like that. What does it mean, Kelsey, when you say, I get what you're upset about? What does that mean? I get. Yeah. So when you get something, it means that you understand that thing. So he's saying he understands what she's upset about. So now it's time for the big challenge of the day. All right, guys, so the big challenge for you to answer today is, in your opinion, what is the best age to start learning a second language and why? Share your thoughts in the comment section below if you are watching us on YouTube or simply drop us a line at hello at reallifeglobal.com. We are looking forward to hearing your responses. And we also have a very nice comment that one of our viewers here on YouTube left in the video 333 in the episode about values that Ethan and I had and um, he says something really nice here Cassie could you read his comment for us sure Gil says thank you so much guys I am from Brazil after I discovered your channel I've been learning a lot I really like the content about connected speech it's very helpful yesterday I had my first meeting in English with a Canadian company and I will work with them in a video project thank you again 
Oh, amazing. Thank you so much, Gil. <laughs> that is fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for leaving the comment and uh, keep following us here on YouTube. Okay. Now, as a final word, I would say that it's a fine line because, yes, it is important for you to be consistent with the strategy you choose to teach English to your child. But also, you don't want to be so rigid and strict with mm -hmm. it. Right, Cassie? Do you have any final words to compliment? From my side, I would say that you have to be deliberate. You have to know that, you know, it's a lot of work now. You know, you have to plan everything and, and keep going consistently. But it is rewarding. And the reward might not come today, but it will happen in the future. Your child will be speaking two, three languages, and you would be so proud. And you also benefit from that. Like, it's it's beneficial for us as well when we're helping our kids, you know, on their journey to bilingualism. So keep going. Yeah, definitely be consistent. Awesome. Amazing. Yeah. And remember, <laughs> early exposure is essential. Absolutely. Very nice. Guys, thank you so much for watching or listening to today's podcast. And stay tuned for next week's one, which is going to come out really soon. All right. Thank you so much, Kasi, for joining me today. It was Thank great you. to have this conversation with you yeah. and hope to talk to you again on another one. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> All right. So, one, two, three. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe you could just share a bit about what was the, the mindset that helped you to be successful doing this? Because I think a lot of where a lot of learners tend to sort of fall down, where they tend to uh, fail is because they're just getting frustrated with themselves. You know, they're watching a TV series, maybe they try to take off the subtitles, they, they get completely lost, mm -hmm. and so they just give up. And yeah. that obviously isn't what happened to you, right? When it comes to using movies and TV series to improve my English, I always had the mindset mm -hmm. of uh, consistency and quality rather than quantity. Meaning that 